Okay, thank you very much indeed for that uh, embarrassing welcome, I think. That my mother could have written that. <laughs> I thought I'd, let me just make sure this comes up. I think it takes a while, it's coming up now, yes. So I thought I'd just uh, give you a view of MIT. Uh, if you haven't been there, this is kind of what it looks like. My office is down in the right hand corner there. And so this is a drone taking photos and spewing data out that you're collecting. And it's pretty impressive, I think, for a drone. So let's see how I go forward here. Uh. Hang on. I don't think it's talking to... Ah, good. So these are some of the companies around uh, MIT. And uh, you'll see that Saudi Aramco has an office there uh, that we're proud to uh, collaborate with. And the number of other companies that are in the uh, data areas, specifically uh, Google and Facebook. So I was asked to talk about big data, uh, but data on its own, you know, isn't that valuable, that it has to be turned into some kind of understanding. And that's the problem that we're facing. Um, I'll talk about the amount of data that we're generating. Part of all the uh, technology revolution that's been happening since about 2012 is due to the vast amounts of data now that have been collected from sensors of all kinds. Uh, you probably in your pocket have a cell phone uh, I was shocked the other day because I, I'd left mine, so I had to go on to Google, and they've got a phone finder. And I found where the phone was, but then they had a little piece about, oh, your tracking history is there. So I clicked on it, and about a year's worth of data was there on where I'd been, which hotels I'd been to, which restaurants I'd been to, Everything, I mean, you could build a very accurate picture of what I do. Um, I play some golf, so they had me on the golf course a little too often, I think. Um, I don't remember playing that much. So I'll talk about the, the, the data that's being generated, but then how we go about understanding the data. And that's the tricky bit. That often the data has been generated and maybe in databases that have been designed, and they won't have been designed for your purpose necessarily, that you have to do a lot of work to get the data into a form that you can handle. Recently, the amount of data is such that we can now have machines generate their own understanding. Machine learning has been enabled in some sense by big data, and I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the move towards autonomous systems because you'll see that things like drones, uh, when we have driverless cars, they're going to be producing a lot of data. And I'll talk a little bit about how you go about building a big data capability because a lot of what's changed uh, is the IT infrastructure. The way we write software now is not the way we wrote it eight years ago. There's a, a story about the Australian government. They issued a contract. They wanted to monitor cars, so they needed to identify car number plates. So they let out a contract for $60 million to a company, uh, be a company like either IBM or uh, uh, Accenture, one of the big uh, software companies, for $60 million. One person read about this, sat down for a week, and wrote a system himself. Today, just one or two people can write systems that you couldn't generate before. If you want to identify number plates, I can go on the online to basically Node.js, and there's 500,000 libraries, and one of them is for identifying, well, there's several actually, for identifying number plates on cars. So you just import that capability. It's already done. 
So this has changed the way that we're building software. And I'd like to just you know, talk about that because we in MIT didn't, or I didn't realize it until a few years ago, how radical that had become. And we were at the table here talking about Amazon. And Amazon now has the biggest data centers in the world. Uh, a few years ago, you would have thought, have thought of Amazon that way. You'd think about them as a supply chain company, you know, delivering goods. Now, they, ha they issue 11 new products every day. If you go to AWS, Amazon Web Services, you'll find that they've got amazing capabilities there. In MIT or in my group, we're never going to buy a server again. Amazon servers are just too cheap. Basically, you can have a machine for $5 a month. And you know you'll get the latest machines. So let's, uh, I'll just introduce what I do or my, some of my background. I was in uh, Internet of Things for a, uh, from about 2000 to 2007. And these devices are responsible for generating a lot of data. You've got in a supply chain RFID chips that generate data. Uh, there are about a trillion of those in the world. And so you've got large numbers of devices generating data. Uh, we've got this, this is my, one of my courses here, seven, billion, seven, million, no, seven billion people in the world generating data. So I used to build models like this. That, so these are, you know, physics. And this is, this is hard stuff. This is why you have high performance computing. You burn up a lot of CPU cycles. And it's given us a good understanding of physics. And we're collaborating with CAX actually on planning how should Saudi Arabia kind of invest in new businesses. And some of the team are looking at the way industries and cities around the world have prospered and what have they done that's special that have allowed them to do that. So that's kind of me and uh, some of the MIT. You already uh, in the oil industry are handling probably some of the biggest data. The seismic data you have, uh, I know a company called Total <coughs> and they generate about uh, five petabytes a month. So not many people handle a petabyte of data. There's probably, you know, a dozen or so companies, 20 companies uh, that are handling petabytes. So that's a lot of data. So you're already in some sense ahead of the game. You've also got, you know, very large models like the previous one. I know Gigapowers, you know, runs at about a, can go up to a billion, three billion cells. I'm probably behind there. And this is some of the visualization which is critical when you're handling large data and already in the seismic area you've got good visualization capabilities but what's happening is that now we're beginning to realize that we need to manage the cities better and so we're, we're collecting data about the cities so this is uh, again some this is LIDAR data I think from cities and LIDAR data is just tens of billions of points. But you can handle those on a laptop now. The, you can go up to, I think the number is something like 500 billion points on a laptop, which is quite impressive. So they're flying LiDAR down the power lines, three gigabytes per mile, and there's 450,000 miles in the US. And so LiDAR data, uh, which is very accurate, this is laser data, this is down to kind of millimeter level at, at, uh, at some areas. This kind of data that's being gathered with drones has revolutionized farming. Farming now has become a high precision industry. So you've got companies now that are basically collecting data from farmers and then writing, over time they correlate the way that the, the seeds were planted, the way that the weather conditions influenced the growing of the crops. These companies sell back to the farmers scripts on how they should farm their own land. So instead of the farmer being the expert now, you've got companies that are selling back to them 
uh, the expertise to manage farms in a more efficient way. So here are some vineyards in California. And this would be in the you know, Midwest, the plains. This is how the tractors look. That they're being instructed where they should go, the depth they should plant the seeds in different parts of their fields. So that whole industry has been revolutionized. I know you yourself probably work uh, 24 by 7. Uh, this is Rio Tinto. And now they've got driverless trucks. So, you know, driverless vehicles are already a reality in some places. You know, of course, they own their own land here, so there's not much danger there of killing people. Um, but certainly, it's changing that industry. So, I noticed in Abu Dhabi there's F1 racing. Uh, and that, you, it used to be about how fast you could change the tires on the car. You know, you, whether you won or not would be determined by that. But then data took over. And now, basically, the winners, they've got teams of IT people analyzing data. So they gather data about the conditions that the car experiences and how the car performs. And then they can build a simulator. I just love this. It's so good. I love the I love that sound of those engines. Anyway, I, I, actually, I noticed some great cars around uh, around here. Um, so, what happens there is that we're gathering data about the performance of a system, a car, and then we're building a model of that car, and now they're using machine learning to design the cars they're coming up with quite exotic designs that you wouldn't normally uh, think of generating. And they're doing it with genetic algorithms and machine learning. So the problem for most companies is that you've got data, but it's, it's not in one place. The, often, like in MIT, I can't get at the financial data. They don't allow me to see it. Uh, I wanted to find out where our students were. How many students did we have? As it happens, I was looking for uh, Indonesia. I couldn't find out because there were something like 20 different databases, and the owners of those databases didn't want to share the data with me. So what it usually happens, you've got little domains in a company where they've got the data, and they say they'll give it you, but a year later, you still don't have it. And it's a problem that it's difficult to, even if you get the data, to integrate it. So we had a project with the state of Massachusetts that uh, the state of Massachusetts has about $50 billion a year kind of revenue. The government collect that, the state government collects that much. And they were, they were worried about fraud, so they wanted us to look at fraud detection. So we spent uh, about a year uh, looking at their database. So the first problem was the database had about 300 columns in it. And they had columns for groups, for divisions, uh, for sub-offices, and we didn't know what these meant. So the first thing was that not only didn't we know, some of the fields they didn't know. That people had left the c company and they weren't sure what were in those fields. So often you're inheriting databases where you don't, you're not really in control of everything. Some of the things were quite obvious, but some not. So we wrote a program to look at fraud detection, and it turned out that in the whole state of Massachusetts, at the top you've got a comptroller, and he had two other people under him. And that was it. That was the fraud detection unit. Now, below that, there were a whole $10 billion domains, you know, that people controlled. But the top guy didn't have access to those. He could ask them for data, but it would take days to get it. So, finding the data is a major issue. You know, you think you've got it, but you don't. So, some of the steps that you need to go through 
to actually manipulate the data, the first thing is usually you're going to be consolidating data from several different data sources. And you're going to have to clean that data. And what I mean by that is that there's no agreement on what do you do if you don't have data for that field. Do you put a zero in there? Do you put a null in there? What do you do? So we, were, we looked at some data that we were, we were plotting out um, the data for all the restaurant licenses in Massachusetts. And we did a pretty good job. And then somebody, and we, we were plotting it out on a, a map. We pulled back so that one of the students actually did, so that we were looking kind of from, you know, at looking down at the whole earth. And we noticed there's a whole load of data in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That didn't make any sense. And what it was that if they didn't know the latitude and longitude of the restaurant, they put zero, zero in there. So we had a whole load of restaurants at zero, zero. So cleaning data is a major task. It'll be about 50% of your time just getting the data into a, a form that you can manipulate. This was uh, the, the system that we built for Massachusetts. And on the, on the right there, you'll see that some graphics where we're kind of linking up and flagging what we think are important or, or, or potentially uh, fraud, fraudulent transactions. So some of them turned out to be, for example, that a person working for the state also did snow plowing and was charging the state. And that's not officially legal to you know, work for the organization that you may be in control of subcontracting to yourself. Um, but visualization is a critical part when you get to big data. One of the problems of having machines flag things is that they flag a lot of false positives. So if you're running intrusion detection systems, for example, for cybersecurity, you'll have literally millions of flags a day I was talking to a medium-sized company, nowhere as big as Aramco, and they had five million flags a day of, of issues that they had to track down, and they didn't have enough humans. So in the end, uh, it's, it's a major issue that you're going to find too many false positives. This is uh, one of my advisors that he was on TV recently. Um, he looked at the data for oil shales in the States, and Basically, what he found was that because the price of oil has dropped, they were drilling in the sweet spots. And so their predictions for the future were not accurate. And so he believes that the oil shale predictions for the US are significantly wrong, that they're overestimating the reserves by a long way, that they're using up the sweet spots. And what's going to be left the, the hard spots to drill. Now, this has an impact on the price, what the price of oil is going to be. And, uh, you know, especially for, for you guys, that maybe it's a good thing if the US doesn't have so much oil. <coughs> but certainly, uh, looking at data, and he would, I mean, he did some really nice analysis, but he wasn't looking to come up with this conclusion. You know, this was kind of an afterthought that he was looking at details, but then realized, no, there's something major wrong here. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a drone flying down a pipeline looking for leaks. And we're entering this world of autonomous systems that already we're seeing drones. We've got a, a flood of data coming in autonomous vehicles. So it's estimated that you know, they'll be running LiDAR and possibly radar and infrared and generating maybe four terabytes a day. And literally you'll have millions of these vehicles. So the question is, you know, how do you handle that much data? So you need machines to step in to automatically analyze the data. And that's already happened in the markets. So you've got high frequency trading going on. This was a crash in 2010 
and the US stock market lost a trillion dollars in 20 minutes. And you can imagine the people sitting there looking on while this is happening. You know, that this is not good when suddenly your stock price is falling and people are buying, and it's machines. You know, they're being programmed, trigger if the price goes below a certain point, sell. And so all the machines were selling, and the only way they could stop this was to shut down the whole market. So machines, we're going to have to use them. We can't handle this, this volume of data, and the data is valuable, but we're going to have to trust the machines. And that may not be that good, that the machines, you know, in some ways are better than us, but still have their flaws. And so it's quite serious. We were talking earlier about the Bitcoin area. Talk about data being valuable. How many own Bitcoins here? Anyone own Bitcoin? Oh, one or two, three. Oh, not as many. Oh, guys, you've got to buy Bitcoins. <laughs> Go out there. They're, <laughs> they're doing well today. They're up 3% today. Um, so this area of, of Bitcoins is, is, again, we're kind of turning, we're trusting machines. That the way it works is that we have a transaction and the miners basically encode this transaction so that it can't be changed. It'll be immutable. So we can trust it. And once it's in the blockchain, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit what the blockchain looks like, it's broadcast out to other people that are keeping the blockchain themselves. So there's thousands of machines, tens of thousands of machines out there with the whole blockchain encoded on the machine. And as transactions happen, they're updated. It turns out, so let me show you, the technology under basically the blockchain is a hash. So the way a hash works is that you can take a string of characters and give it numerical values and apply a function to that. In this case, we're just going to add the numbers up. An actual hash would be more complicated. But in some sense, that 52 would be the hash of the word hello. Now if I change a letter in the word, the hash has, is going to change. If I change the E to an A, then its value is going to change. This works for very large documents. So we, instead of one word, we could have a million words and we could take the hash of it, and it would be still a small number. So that number, it's a, typically a 160-bit or 256-bit number. So it's a fairly short, kind of concise string of bits, but it uniquely locks that document. Now if any of those characters are ever changed, the hash will change. So, if the hashes don't change, and it's very difficult to construct a document to have a particular hash. From the document I can get a hash, from a hash I can't reconstruct a document. Okay, so it's called a one-way function. So the way it works in a blockchain is that we have a load of transactions. So down the bottom here, these T's are all transactions. So we take the hash of those transactions, and then at the next level, we combine the hashes in pairs. So each pair of hashes now, we hash those. And we form a tree. So I might have a 1,000 transactions, but I'm going to end up with this tree, and at the top, I have one hash. Now, I encode that into the blockchain, but I encode it with some other information. There's a timestamp, and there's a previous hash of the last block. So I encode this, this is called a Merkle root, this top level hash of the tree. So I encode the Merkle root, the previous hash, the timestamp, and something called a nonce. And this is where the machines, the miners have to do work. They have to guess a nonce so that the hash will have leading zeros. Up the top here, you see, 
we hash, and we need it to start 0, 0, 0 something. The first miner to actually get the right nonce that has that basically says, I've solved the puzzle. Sends the, the result out to all the other miners, broadcasts it out to the tens of thousands of other machines, and they've got a choice now of including this block in the blockchain or not. So they can check that the person has actually solved the puzzle, and it's then in their interest to include it in the blockchain, because if they don't, they'll fall behind, because everyone else, it's in their interest to include it. So basically, the machines themselves are ensuring honesty, that tens of thousands of machines will, will stay in lockstep, because they can then move on and try and make money mining other blocks. So that's the way the blockchain works. And the money gets created when the miner solves the puzzle, they're given a certain number of bitcoins. It used to be 24, it's less now, now that they're worth 15,000 rather than a couple of hundred dollars. But that's the way the, the currency is created. So as part of this transaction here, the miner will add the 24 coins as a transaction to themselves. And so, only so many bitcoins can be created. Now to write this is not that bad. It takes probably a, a, a day or so to write a to blockchain. So people are creating their own blockchains, not to produce currency, but to encode transactions. So for example, you could encode when you're, you, know, you buy or sell a house. It would be a country could encode that in a blockchain because it would lock it down. So blockchains are going to get quite popular. Let me move on here. Oh, I see. <clears throat> so the tooling to understand technology has changed. So machine learning, in 2012, MIT was trying to decide what it should teach in computer science. And neural nets had been taught for the last 15 years, but neural nets were pretty useless. So they thought that maybe they should stop teaching about neural nets. Uh, but they decided that since other colleges would be teaching it, maybe they'd leave it in. What happened in 2012 was that Jeffrey Hinton suddenly cracked classifying in images and did it using neural nets. So there was a database of about uh, a million, oh, one million two hundred thousand images that have been tagged. You know, so this is a donkey, this is a horse, this is a building, this is an aeroplane. Basically, Jeffrey Hinton could identify and classify the difference between you know, a giraffe and a, and a panda bear. So classification is at the basis of machine learning. Basically, it's trying to decide what class does this belong to? Does it belong to the, r the red dots or the green dots? And neural nets kind of imitate the human brain in some sense that you have neurons that take in inputs, and if the inputs are strong enough and exceed some threshold, they'll fire, the neuron will fire, and the axon will have a, a signal go down it to the next neuron. So they're fairly simple, and what happens in a computer neural net is that you've got inputs that are weighted, they're usually pooled together, so that's the incoming signal, 
and now there's a threshold of whether to fire or not. And if they fire, then you've got an output of a certain kind. When you string all this together in a neural net, it's equivalent to kind of having an input and having a function operate on it. So you can imagine it like I've got a certain inputs and now I've got a certain surface being generated. This function generates a surface. In, in this case, it might be a line. Um, I was going to show you a real-time demo, but I don't have time. Uh, but this changed everything. The fact that suddenly neural nets could identify images. And so this is what part of a neural net will do. They're, they're convolutions that might identify edges, say, of a, a building or an object. So a convolution just works something like this. This is the only technical bit in the whole talk that I've got this kernel and I apply it to that image in the middle and just loop over that and the convolve feature comes out. And so these would be the convolutions. So they're not really meaningful to us, but people are already applying it to identifying rock types. So the Chinese have written quite a lot of papers on automatic identification of rocks. <coughs> So, that was a few years ago, 2014. So recently, this year, the same guy, that guy is Demis Hassabis, he works for Google. Uh, they basically took on the best AI game, chess playing game, which was called Stockfish. And already the, the computers have higher ratings than any human. So the best human is rated at 2,900. And Houdini is rated at 3,200. Ribka about 3,100. Alpha Zero recreated all of chess knowledge in four hours. It was only trained for four hours. 
and it beat Stockfish every time. That it won, out of 100 games, it won 48 <coughs> and drew all the others, never lost. So, and it came up with all the strategies that the humans have come up with over, you know, the 100 or so years or 200 years, however chess, how long it's been going. But that's pretty impressive and then pretty scary that now it is superhuman at chess. So the Atari simulator that Demis Hassabis kind of built was based on having a simulator. You've got a game that's a, just a simulator that you basically have states and actions that the neural net learns and can play the game. So you could do the same with your simulator, your gigapowers, that you could use gigapowers to train the neural net to manage oil wells. That, that's, that's my most extreme statement when I say you could. Maybe you could, but it'd be worth trying. So we've, we've, you know, we're good at physics. We know how to do that, but if we put it together with machine learning, we might get something that's superhuman. So my sense is the future is going to belong to the human and the machine, that we're going to have to leverage these machines. Um, the clock tick for de decision making in industry is getting faster. Like I say, Amazon is turning out 11 new products a day deploying software now, DevOps, the time has been cut from months or years, it used to be three years, you know, to develop a product. Now it's down, they can, they're putting out new products every, you know, day. I mean, they've got teams of people, but it's never been so fast. And I'll just end with this, uh, this was 2012, robots. So, you know, they've got vision systems, they're doing some machine learning. I think there's one that's going to try and turn a, a, an oil well valve. <laughs> Missed. <clears throat> this was three years later. Okay, you get the idea. So, the clock tick, you know, in three years, there's huge progress. The whole of machine learning only started in 2012. It hasn't been going long. These are, these are the kind of tools that you'll be using. If you're handling big data, you're probably using Spark, you're probably using Docker. TensorFlow is uh, Google's machine learning code. Um, you can pick it up, it's free, it's pretty awesome. You know, what should your team know? My sense today is those tools. And you'll be operating in the cloud. Um, Amazon now, the capabilities of managing machines, orchestrating machines, 
is pretty awesome. That this is a course we give, a one-week course that we give for to exec ed people about, you know, the things that we think they should know. Um, the applied computing. So leveraging these tools. This is this is a, a project. It's a three-week project the students did. Uh, this actually just before Christmas. So they get they're given marks for class participation. So somebody has to sit there and mark how often they answer questions. So that, that, was, that was using uh, Google's API for face recognition. Uh, but you can pick that up and you can deploy a system as I said, these were students, three weeks, and they, they will, you know, plenty of other classes to work on. Um, so my sense is that, you know, you're, comp you're gonna be competing with other corporations that are armed with machine learning and, and good data. Now, your defense is that you may have better data than them about your own operations. In the case of Aramco, that's for sure. Um, but you know, you're, going to, you're going to have to innovate. Um, and the good news is that you don't need huge teams to do it. In software now, you, know, you can have two or three people, and you can turn out pretty good products and turn them out fast. I'm going to stop there. I'm over time, I know. So thank you for listening.